Good afternoon and welcome to OAG's webinar. I'm Becca Rowland and I'm a partner at Midas Aviation and I'm going to be ho uh, your host today. Pardon me there. <clears throat> Please do ask questions as we go through, as we always ask you to. It's always nice to have a bit of interaction from the audience. Um, and we'll try and pick up as many questions as we can as we go through. And you will get access to the webinar afterwards, as we always say. Um, today, we're going to be taking a look at the hot topic of sustainability. It's one of the subjects that's been gaining ground, and rightly so, but it seems to have taken on a new urgency in the past few months. OEG has been looking at this subject for several years now to see what they can contribute uh, to help partners across the industry make better decisions. And today we're going to be showing you where that effort has, has got to today. Um, but it wouldn't be an OAG webinar without the usual look at all the latest trends in flying and getting you up to speed on where the industry is at. Um, and so with the help of some OEG data and some pretty slides and charts, um, we're going to be looking for the trends and helping you understand um, better what's coming down the line. And we're also going to revisit some of that volatility data that we showed you just uh, last month. So to help me today, we've got um, uh, an all OEG team. We've got uh, John Grant, as, as we usually have, as the senior analyst from OEG. And we've got Matt, who's uh, EVP content, and Mark, who's EVP commercial. Welcome to all of you, John, Matt, and Mark. Hi, good afternoon. Good John, afternoon. before we start, have you got any sort of words of wisdom or you know, thoughts about the industry where it's at? Obviously, We've started to have some of the big conferences, the IATA AGM, the World Roots have, have happened in the last, uh, well, since we, we last did the webinar. What does that tell us? Uh, it tells us people are traveling and people are meeting, which is great. Um, it also tells us that um, through some of the stories we're seeing, there's more confidence in the market um, as we go through the data, not necessarily translating into uh, increases in capacity and getting back to 2019 levels. But I think generally the last month has seen more optimism than pessimism. Um, and of course, Brighton are fourth in the Premier League. So the world's a happy place at the moment, Becca. We, we do these webinars, one in the morning, aimed a bit more at Asia and, and Europe and Africa and the Middle East. And then in the afternoon, one, this one, a bit more North America and, uh, and Europe. And this morning, it was all cricket analogies, wasn't it? And now we're back to football this afternoon, I see. Yeah, well, we tackled all of those, so we're going to uh, carry on and hopefully get a yellow card on the football ones this afternoon. Mark, Matt, anything to uh, anything from your side in terms of sort of observations of where we're at, um, given that people are beginning to travel again, as we've seen with some of these big events? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's been, uh, particularly from my side of things, around sustainability, hugely active few weeks we've had with a number of announcements and, and COP26 coming up from a kind of a, a global not just aviation perspective so you know, lots to talk about and uh, looking forward to getting into some of that later on yeah right. i think i think from my, from my perspective i guess just to john's point about world routes and seeing the the airport and airline and tourism community really coming together again and mm -hmm. there does seem to be a sense of optimism coming out of that event and obviously a, a lot of new airline new route announcements in the last couple of weeks and obviously as we'll talk about here the the reopening of the transatlantic market which um is going to be interesting to see how that plays out yeah that's great good good and it's good um i know we're going to be you know focusing on sustainability and i'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what you've uh, you're bringing to the table today matt so let's have a look at some of the data we've seen this slide before <coughs> this um capacity scheduled seats uh for each month uh, compared to the same month in 2019. So we're comparing 2020 dates with 2019 and we're also comparing 21, uh, 2021 dates with 2019, which still seems to be the way to make the most sense of the data. Um, so lots of positive upward trends here, aren't there, John? And I'll come to you first. You know, lots of lines that are moving from the bottom left to the top right, which is what we want to see, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Um, let's not get too carried away though. This is um, still at um, an overall level about 30% below where we were in 2019. But there is, you know, every region in the world uh, with the notable exception of the Southwest Pacific is uh, trending in the right direction. Um, and, and that's got to be good. Europe started earlier, obviously we can see that um, from uh, the Battle of the Beach Towers that starts in June of every year um, and continues through to about now. So there's lots of 
lots of optimism there. Um, but we're even seeing North America and Africa uh, coming back, the Middle East with uh, the big three carriers putting more capacity back in, the reopening and access to the United Arab Emirates. Um, yeah, it's, it's generally a really positive message, Becca. Um, bit of a, a slide back down in China, um, a spike in September uh, because of Golden Week and the public holiday, and that's that's just drifted back a little bit. But but generally, it's it's looking good, and we're seeing more and more markets um, re-energizing, opening. Um, we're seeing Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, um, Singapore's virtual travel lanes. It's um, it's full of positivity. It's a it's a good place at the moment. Yeah, it's been a been a long while coming since we've had a, a chart with uh, quite so much positives in it. And and since we 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 did the last webinar a month ago, we've had quite a bit of movement in in South Southeast Asia, haven't we? In terms of countries reassessing this sort of zero case approach to to COVID. Yeah, and for some of them, you know, it's um, we're coming into what would normally be their peak tourism season, places like Thailand and uh, Bali. Um, so you know this they had to make it happen um it was it would be an even bigger economic disaster if they were to miss their peak season uh and subsequently um we'd be in a situation where uh, they'd be 12 12 months behind the curve again um you know and even in southern africa um as rodolfo's just asked that's that's coming back um not as quickly but south african airways mark 17 version 2 i think are about to start flying again um, and there's a bit more air, air capacity going in there and it's been taken off the red list to the UK so you know there'll be a lot of leisure traffic going back and forth from Europe to South Africa I think this winter so generally things are across most markets um, looking up um, we are by no means out of the wood no room for complacency whatsoever um, lots of variables out there not just um, COVID variants, the price of oil, um, just economic activity generally, it's, um, you know, it's, there's still a long way to go. And, and this is this is just seats, obviously, it's capacity, it's not passenger traffic. So that's still, that's still a bit more of a challenge, isn't it, for airlines? But you just mentioned the price of oil, and uh, my understanding is it's probably nearly double what it was a year ago. So it's it's just approaching a hundred dollars a barrel so it's um that's going to be a challenge isn't it for the airlines as they it, you know this is good in terms of capacity there's more demand they're beginning to recover but but what role does that high price of oil play in their recovery uh well it, i mean typically in the last 18 months uh, the price of oil has been very soft um in normal times it's about 20 percent of an airline's uh cost if not more uh, I think for many airlines, the, the biggest challenge is um, how much they will have hedged, how much they will have been able to have uh, bought in advance at fixed prices. Um, hedging hasn't been as popular as it previously was through the pandemic. Airlines haven't had the cash to be able to hedge in some cases. Um, so if it gets passed through to the consumers, uh, then it, you know, it might impact uh, demand and elasticity. Uh, I see in the UK today that um, airfares increased by 9% in September, according to the British government. Um, so, and they're a consumer index. So, if we're if we're seeing fares already moving up, you know, um, putting an extra cost on would would perhaps suppress some of that demand. And uh, of course. Heathrow yesterday got approval for a 50% increase in their uh, passenger fees and charges to the airlines by uh, in the next couple of years. That will be a direct pass through to the consumer. Um, the airlines are not going to be wearing that as part of their cost. Um, so you know, again, that could that could impact uh, potential demand. All of which really points to the fact that. It's very unlikely, and we will discuss this later, that we will see much capacity growth um, through the winter. You know, there is there's more than enough um, capacity in the market to accommodate current demand. And I think um, some airlines might actually turn back on their revenue management tools and start using them through the winter. Right, very, very interesting. We've had a question to say, you, you know, 
what do we know about um, Europe and particularly the, the low cost carriers? I'm afraid we haven't pulled out analysis by low cost versus legacy carrier this time. We, we quite often do, but we, we just can't fit everything in. What we have done though is um, looked at domestic versus international. Um, so this is globally, again, looking at the percent change versus um, 2019 for the same month. Both international and domestic moving up now, aren't they, John? So that's um, certainly since the, I guess, June, May, June time when Europe began to open, uh, we've really seen that that international travel or capacity kick in a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And we will, you know, we will have opportunities to see that grow to the year end, um, more transatlantic capacity. Um, now that the United States has reopened for European travellers from the 8th of November, um, more international capacity in Southeast Asia, um, you know, between Thailand and surrounding countries, Singapore, um, Malaysia and Vietnam, uh, that's that's all positive as well. And, and the airlines desperately need this, Becca, because domestic flying generally uh, doesn't have the same profitability margins as international services and for many airlines you know the um the international network is is where they make their profits so we want that back as quickly as possible um and it's it's still got a long way to go i mean it, it looks good but let's keep this in context we're still at only about half um of where we were in 2019 so long long way to go yet Right, very, very interesting. What we've done now is taken this same chart and applied it to, done the same piece of analysis on a number of different countries. So uh, we've got here uh, the US up at the top left, uh, UK, uh, Brazil, India, Mexico, and we've added in China, which isn't in Europe and North America, but it's just interesting to see what's happening there. And so this morning we had a couple of examples from other Asian countries, I think it was South Korea and Japan, and, and they were just like this China one with international just flatlining along the bottom here. But these these are a bit more positive, aren't they? Certainly the US looking looking good here, but um, domestic sort of flat now. Is, 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 is this the fact that domestic hasn't recovered completely to 2019 levels? Is this a is this accounted for by the lack of corporate travel perhaps or is it the the impact of dom international to domestic connections or what why, why have we not seen domestic come up above the 2019 level yeah. I, I think it's a combination of factors um and you've touched on a couple of them you know in many many hub airports chicago's atlanta's newark's places such as those 30, 30% of a transatlantic flight, maybe even more, could be connecting onwards to a US domestic market. Um, so if that, if those flows are, are not there, then the capacity doesn't need to be there. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, I also think in, in some countries, um, the, the bureaucracy and the paperwork you need at the moment for travel is, is a cause of concern. Um, you know, it's like playing, um, shuffling a deck of cards with the various QR codes you need and the pieces of paper to get on an aeroplane at the moment. So uh, I think that's disconcerting for some people, but but generally it's it's looking better from an international perspective in most markets. But the real worry continues to be a market like China, where um, although it looks a long, long way from where we are um, geographically, this time in 2019, about 10% of all capacity in China was international. Um, you know, and a lot of that was regional, regional flying to Japan, South Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, and other such points. And now it's less than one percentage point um, of the capacity that's being offered in China. Um, and it's it's going nowhere and it's not going anywhere quick, quickly. You know, we've um, no expectation of anything significant changing until after the Winter Olympics. Uh, and that's not going to be until the end of January um, 2022. So it's still another three and a half, four months away yet. Mm. And, and any any word from any of you on Mexico here? I mean, bucking the trend, really, aren't they, with this very strong international growth um, in capacity, you know, so that they're now well ahead of where they were two years ago. Yeah, and it, a lot of that is around connectivity to the US. Um, Mexico never closed, did it? It, it, it 
no. essentially stayed open throughout the whole of COVID-19. It was down to the individual's choice. And with many other parts of the world closed, you know, um, it was come on down time to Cancun for anyone in, in the United States. Um, so uh, the carriers have taken advantage of that um, and, you know, they've enjoyed some growth. Uh, whether it will be sustainable, whether that market will continue to go back to Cancun or we'll want to go further afield into Europe or some other point, um, next summer will be a good test of, of the real demand um, for international capacity to and from Mexico. Okay, let's have a look at um, where we are, again by region, but just over the last 12 weeks. So this is showing the percentage change in capacity versus uh, 20, the same week in 2019. And as John said at the beginning, globally we're looking at um, just under 30%, so minus 29% compared to 2019 in terms of capacity. Quite big variations between the regions, but, but everywhere looking better than it was certainly, apart from the Southwest Pacific, which is uh, still at 70% below 2019. Some I guess these numbers are quite positive, aren't they? We've spent a lot of the year looking at numbers that were in excess of 50%, so I'm, I, I'd like to think these are positive now. Yeah, it's um, it's getting better by by the week and by the month. Um, and, you know, you're right, this time last year, the numbers looked horrendous and um, there is a steady improvement. Uh, need to be just a little bit careful around Europe. I think we're coming to the end of the, uh, IATA summer season so you know that's when airlines certainly through to mid-December and the beginning of the ski season typically phase back some of their flying uh, and reduce their capacity so that that may see us um, fall a, a little bit further back in the next couple of weeks. Ryanair and Wiz continue to um, you know operate to near 100% capacity um, although interestingly uh, Wiz have just fallen out of the top 20 largest airlines in the world, replaced by Air France, um, which is, I'm sure, something that will change quickly. Uh, Wizz Air will come back strongly. Um, and Ryanair continue to add more and more capacity. I think they're about 1.8 million seats a week at the moment. So it's, um, Europe may just settle back a little bit. Uh, the Middle East um, could be interesting if Australia opens. That will see more connecting traffic going through, particularly pre-Christmas. Uh, so I think that's good. And uh, Mark, I mean, you've got a keen interest in North America. Would you expect that to get better in the next couple of weeks, at least from an international perspective? Yeah, I definitely think it's going to get better in the next, I guess, month month or so. I think the, the interesting thing is going to be around, obviously, Thanksgiving and then getting into the Christmas period. Um, Kind of interested on this slide and the previous one and, and your comment about you know for a lot of markets domestic flying is effectively underpinned by you know the connecting traffic the higher yielding international traffic um and it kind of reflects here as well right we've got china's at minus three next lowest is north america kind of underpinned by the chinese domestic market and the u.s domestic market but then you can see the impacts in the middle east where typically it's about six three in traffic and as much as some markets are opening back up, still not getting back above 30, 40% down. Um, obviously, excluding China, still 50% down. Aside from one or two reasonably sized domestic markets, a lot of the the gap there is the international slash connecting traffic that is some way off yet. Yeah, it's, uh, there's so many ways we could cut and slice the data um, to, to show that, but uh, hopefully over the webinars over the, over the year, we, we, we do that and you can see all of those different elements coming to play. Um, really good. Um, we're gonna look a little bit forward now. So this was a, a look 12 weeks back. If we look through to the end of the year, uh, we've shown a slide like this um, repeatedly um, over the months where we use the snapshot feature in OEG Analyzer to see where capacity in the schedule was at a previous point of time and how that's changed and how what we've been seeing is the capacity come out week by week. Um, so this yellow line, the thick yellow line here is uh, what we see in the schedule today and the, the line above with the larger yellow dots is what was showing in the schedule for each of these weeks on the, the horizontal axis back in the middle of September. And then we've got another line for point in, in mid-August and 
early August and in early July. So we were seeing a lot of change week by week, capacity being withdrawn, as John, John said earlier. But once we get into the winter IATA season, which starts at the end of October, actually all the airlines are sort of, the, the schedule's been quite static, really. Matt, do you want to say a bit about perhaps why that is and the fact that these are schedules that will have been filed after the pandemic started? Is that what we're seeing here? I, th I think it's, thanks, Rebecca. I think it's definitely a contributing factor. Um, there will, of course, be, you know, a huge influence on the schedule from, um, you know, what's going on in different markets as they they reopen and so on and so forth. But I think this is the first IATA season where network planners have been able to submit their schedule knowing about COVID-19 and, and having had that in their mindset. So you know, everything we've seen through um, 2020 and into 2021 so far were schedules that were in the system um, back in sort of January 2020. And so we've seen that kind of uh, what we've come to know as the erosion of that schedule, that kind of consistent fortnightly reduction in capacity as the airlines try and kind of right size their, their network. Um, but from, from this season, uh, as it's sort of due to start at the end of the month, as you mentioned, I think we're now looking at data which the network planners have had a chance to, to consider what should the schedule look like in a world with COVID-19 um, and to kind of start from a plan that uh, has that in mind, as I say. So I, I suspect that um, uh, we will definitely continue to see volatility and, and some markets will go up, some will come down, but um, we're, we're probably going to see a kind of a, a smaller amount of volatility in, in that winter season than we have done in the past. And, and in fact, it's a unique uh, winter season we're heading into. Um, it's going to be probably the first time I can recall um, when we're actually likely to see more capacity in the first week of the winter season than we saw at the back end of the summer season. Traditionally, you know, there's a bit of a, a fall off, um, but it, it looks like, um, you know, that capacity is staying there and it's sticking. Uh, to Matt's point, you know, there's, there's a bit more confidence about um, putting capacity in and letting it sit there, uh, which, is, which is obviously good news for everyone. But there is a, we, we are seeing this slow increase here, aren't we? Which means that um, by the end of the year, we're looking at capacity, if this is to be believed, of about 89 million seats a week rather than 79 that we've got now. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we'll get to 89. I mean, you know, if we, if we go back as, um, as you can see in some of this data in August, on a rolling three month forward basis, we were seeing airlines cut anything up to 14 million seats for the next three months. Um, last week, that was down at 6 million. So, you know, that would suggest there's a little bit more stability. And I think if we then look slightly further out, I think we will probably see perhaps airlines cutting three to 4 million uh, seats. Um, on a rolling three-month basis. So, so I think 89 is still slightly optimistic. 85 would be really good um, if we could get to there by the end of the year. Um, but, you know, let's, let's put that back into the context of where we were a couple of years ago. That would still be 20% down um, on 2019. And my, my latest <coughs> running total gives me about 3.7 billion seats um, to be operated this year compared to 5.7 billion uh, in 2019. And if you look at the last six months, you know, the position looks better. Um, so the trend is in the right direction, but but this is, this is going to be a flat line at best for the winter. Um, airlines aren't going to be put in, rushing to put seats back for all of the circumstances and factors we discussed earlier. Right, and so we've got another slide now that looks a little bit further ahead. So we look to the, uh, this is the full winter season. So from the end of October through to the end of March. Um, and, and we're showing three lines here. The, the black line is what actually happened um, in the winter 2019, 2020. The gray line is what was in the schedule at the beginning of that period. So the equivalent of where we are today. And the yellow line is where we are today. So looking forward to the next, um, the next, Five months or so. 
so we are seeing continued rise really all the way through to the end of March. Um, just very gradual, as we just saw through to Christmas, but um, it, it keeps going. And so you think this is just a bit too optimistic, John? I think it's a bit too optimistic. I think, you know, I think things are improving. And, and if you look at that line, we could we could almost say, you know, week of the 13th of December, um, more Australian international capacity coming back ahead of Christmas, as, as the Australian government has in, indicated. Um, we can see the 22nd of November as a bit of an uplift there. A lot of that will be transatlantic with the reopening of the US. And then we can see some bits into the new year where there's more capacity coming back in in Southeast Asia. So we could actually pinpoint where each of these increases are currently or what's driving those increases. Um, but I think I think it will just shave back. I don't, we're not gonna see a touch wood, we're not gonna see anything like we saw in winter 1920, otherwise we're back into some horrible times. Um, but let's not forget, you know, COVID cases in the United Kingdom are increasing. They're in, they've doubled in Poland in the last week. Governments might start taking some more action that, that makes travel a little bit more difficult if uh, things begin to go in the wrong direction. And, and, and travellers may feel less confident about travelling as well. And we've talked a lot over the months about you know, traveller confidence and what it is they're looking for to, to persuade them to travel as well as the, what governments do, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. OK, we wanted to take a look at a few of the other sort of trends that are ha we're seeing in the market now before we get on to talking about sustainability. So one of them is that we're seeing a rise in um, the number of A380s operating, admittedly um, a lot of them by Emirates. So this chart shows December 2019, 2020, 2021, with the number of uh, flights being operated uh, that are A380s and which airline is operating them. We were talking about the demise of the A380, weren't we, John? But is, is this a bit of a comeback or is this just um, that Emirates has A380s and they're beginning to fly them? Uh, it, it, it's a lot of it is to do with Emirates, obviously, but some of it is opportunistic or um, necessity uh, for some of the airlines who are bringing the aircraft back. So, you know, BA, um, they have a, a couple of markets that are very large, but had some bilateral restrictions or nuances about them where you want the largest possible aircraft and perhaps only two flights uh, a day rather than four or five. Um, South Africa and Johannesburg is one of those. Hong Kong is another. Um, I think it's going into Miami for the winter, which, which would make sense with the cruise market and the potential there for winter sun. China's, China's Southern, well, you know, the Chinese airlines do what they want. Emirates, we've spoken about. Uh, Qatar Airways um, are faced with having to use the A380 because of some of the uh, ongoing issues they have with the A350. Um, so, you know, that's, that's necessity. And of course, Singapore Airlines still have a relatively large A380 fleet. And with Australia reopening, uh, and their virtual travel lanes, uh, I'm sure that they will be looking to take advantage um, of the kangaroo route and quickly stimulate demand and, and take some of that pent up volume that, that's out there and waiting. Um, but I can't, I can't see Lufthansa bringing it back, um, nor Malaysia Airlines. Um, I can't see Thai Airways having a commercial need for it, although that doesn't mean they won't bring it back. Um, no one can second guess what what's going to happen at Thai Airways. Um, and similarly, I can't see Air France really bringing it back. Um, in fact, they've stated it's not coming back. So uh, it's it, it's got a role, Becca, but it's, you know, it's been usurped by the 350, the 787, and now, of course, the 321 and the 737 MAX um, are, are getting more momentum on long-haul services as well. So I, I know that Ishka were reporting uh, this last week or so that, um, airlines are, are firming up some of their aircraft orders and they're particularly going for some of the slightly larger um, narrow body aircraft so like the a321 for for the reasons of sustainability i guess but 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 other reasons as well and you and i were talking about the maps as well so what what are the changes are we seeing in, in terms of what airlines are looking at for their fleet uh it's it's just it's all about uh efficiency and right sizing aircraft to market need and and 
Um, some of that's quite exciting because we're seeing some experimentation. Um, you know, United have an, announced 10 new European routes um, next summer, some of which will, you know, be operated by narrow-bodied equipment. Uh, we've obviously got Aer Lingus who are doing things, TAP Air Portugal, JetBlue have started Heathrow and Gatwick and are looking to start other destinations in uh, Western Europe. Um, so, you know, and at some point you've got to think a major European low-cost carrier will have a go at the Atlantic as well uh, in some shape or form. So it's um, it's just the right size aircraft for the market and um, with all of that pent-up demand for next summer, um, it's it, a little bit of it will perhaps um, stick, uh, but it, it's it's a great chance to be experimenting. I, I know that Delta reported that they had put some of their wide bodies onto domestic routes with the pandemic and knowing that they would cost more to operate than the aircraft that they had been flying, but then were surprised at the take up of the premium economy cabin for leisure travel um, and, and were saying that possibly those seats weren't as accessible for leisure travellers before because of you know corporate bookings. But actually mm -hmm. they're, they're seeing this whole new phenomenon of, of um, well it's not new is it, but, but you, the phenomenon of, of um, premium economy travel and, yeah. and people wanting to, to use that. So is that something well, that we're going to do much more broadly? I think so. I mean, you and I have always needed that extra legroom, haven't we? <laughs> As vertically challenged people, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, but but you know, I think I think there is that. Um, it, we always thought about uh, premium economy pre-COVID as being, you know, a very strong growth market, and I think that's going to continue. As we come out into 2022, Emirates have launched their premium economy. U.S. carriers have uh, put it on their aircraft on transatlantic services. And you know, it in terms of profitability, um, airlines were saying that premium economy was one of their most profitable um, cabins. Um, so I think we're likely to see that. But I also think there's there's a large community of people who, either because uh, they you know they want to revenge spend, they're going to hit their bucket list for travel, um, or they they just um, want that bit more social distance from other people on the aircraft will look to business class fares. And, and that means airlines are gonna to have to change their revenue parameters. They're gonna to have to think about how do we accommodate and get a share of that leisure market, but still keep some space back for the high, the even higher yield in business traveler when he does return. Um, I think this could lead to the demise of first class uh, for some carriers. It's, um, you know, it's getting to a point where are you better with a, a six cabin, a six seat first class cabin when you could get 12 or 14 business class seats into the same space and generate more revenues? Um, so I, I, I think it, we're in an evolutionary phase um, and it will, you know, it will play out and it will be quite interesting. But um, yeah, I, I look forward to the opportunity to a 34 inch seat pitch on an aircraft at some point. <laughs> Okay, we've had a question in from Olaf that uh, asked us about, uh, can we say a little bit about how countries' legislation's role uh, affects recovery? And this slide, I think we, we showed it last time and um, we've updated it with the latest data, really shows that once you can get your head around all the, all the lines that are buzzing around. So what we've got here is uh, along the, the bottom axis, international capacity this week versus in 2019 for each of these countries. And on the vertical axis, the proportion of the population that's had at least one dose of vaccine. And we show two points in time. Uh, for each of these countries, we show where they were on the 15th of July and then, or the week of the 15th, and then again this week. And, you know, on the whole, we see them moving in this um, towards the top right corner. So international capacity is rising and the proportion with vaccines is rising. But then we have this stubborn group over here on the left where it doesn't seem to matter how much. Uh, vaccination there is the international travel hasn't hasn't improved and or, or grown at least I guess that's that is what happens with governments isn't it this is this is showing us what happens with government policy but but we expect this to improve don't we um I'd, I'd like to think so I think I think there's two factors at play on that left hand side with all of those vertical lines one of it one of them has been you know until very recently uh, lockdowns in all of those countries and and that's changing in Thailand, Vietnam and Indonesia and Malaysia 
and they're beginning you know in the next couple of months we should see those begin those lines begin to sort of become more horizontal um, but the, the big problem back of all of those countries quite frankly is China um, you know until China reopens and allows international services in many of these markets are so dependent on Chinese capacity and Chinese markets it, um, it's very difficult for them to grow out um, and, and improve their situations. You take places like Japan and South Korea, you know, there are literally uh, hundreds of thousands of seats a week uh, between those countries. And um, at the moment, uh, you know, what used to be a golden triangle is just, just an empty space. Mm, interesting, isn't it? I'm sure we'll come back to this at some future point and see. Yeah, and, you know, just to make the point because um, it, it's it's a little bit relevant. I think um, Greece will slide uh, back um, to probably its normal levels of capacity as the winter season closes. It's benefited from you know not closing any of its borders and uh, no. Vaccine, vaccination controls, so it was a hot destination in the summer, um, and it, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna fall back a little, little bit. But um, you can see the ones that have done well. This is a very good illustration of uh, what happens when you do open your borders, and, and to a point that Craig makes, you know, the the golden moment appears to be about seventy percent vaccination rates, and and things start to move. Uh, and, and we've had a comment from Edward Clayton as well, who, <clears throat> who's been a guest for us on, on one of the webinars before, um, saying Malaysia has opened, um, it allowed citizens to travel from this week. So if we were to do this again in a month, we should see Malaysia begin to move yeah. uh, right across the... Yeah, let's hope so. Uh, you know, there's a lot, lots to be positive about. Um, so uh, the sooner everyone starts travelling and buying those tickets, the better. So we've got one more slide before we get to the sustainability uh, slides, um, and this is just revisiting uh, volatility. We showed last time um, some data about how the schedules had changed um, for particular countries in the two weeks before flights were due to happen. So we've got three regions here, Europe, North America and Asia, and for each of these we've shown um, for a week um, around the 20th of September, um, the yellow vertical bar is uh the number of seats the capacity for that week and the gray bar is what the capacity was showing two weeks beforehand so the percentage is is how it, much it changes in that two weeks and we've done that for for six months um a week over each of the six months and then also pointed two years ago so we can see a sort of comparison with a baseline that we might expect in more normal times and certainly for europe here it's got better each month, hasn't it, John? We're seeing just, and maybe Mark or, or, or Matt, you're, you want to speak to this. It's um, just much less schedule volatility happening. Yeah, I think it yeah. was just a reflection of the comments we've made, made thus far, that with the, the market starting to open up, carriers getting a, a little bit more comfortable or confident around the stability of those markets. Um, it's just a, a natural reflection there. Um, I, I think it's it's going to be fascinating in the, the next webinar as we update once we're into the, the beginning or the, the start of the winter season, how that changes. I would think it's going to get a little bit more volatile again, certainly leading up to and, and probably through the end of the year. Um, and I think in Asia, again, just to, to the points we've mentioned before, the in many ways the sort of stop-start, but mostly stop nature um, of the market there just now in general. Um, it's just reflected in the in the volatility. Mm. I think that Becca, for me, there are a couple of things that you know suggest we're heading in the right direction. If you look at Europe and September, you know the percentage volatility that we see there compared that to um, April, then in percentage terms, it you know it's now looking almost inconsequential um, and is. Is 20 times less than what we were seeing in April, but even more importantly, it's off a larger capacity base. So um, you know we're not seeing as many changes, and uh, it's there's more seats in the market. So that's absolutely great. But I think the, the most staggering uh, thing, and um, you and I are long enough in the in the tooth to uh, to follow the numbers too closely. Um, this is the first week I can ever remember when there was virtually no schedule changes 
or capacity changes in the US market. All of the major four carriers, so American Delta, United and Southwest, are operating within 100 plus or minus seats, the amount of capacity they operated last week, which is... They've, perhaps they've given their network planners the week off, given that they've worked so hard for the last 18 <laughs> months. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the other thing is we may not have loaded the schedules, but we have. So, you know, I'm sure I'm sure there are factors, but um, it, it's just if we can get back to that sort of level of consistency and capacity, then, you know, we know that we're on we're heading in the right direction and things things are only going to get better. It isn't, it's not a trivial matter, is it? Because as we've said before, when the schedules change, it affects lots of uh parties in the in the ecosystem for travel but also travelers as well doesn't it yeah absolutely yeah okay that's um really interesting let's have a look at uh, sustainability um so this is a topic that oeg has been looking at for some time now um and, and matt do you want to tell us a bit about what you've been doing with um some data and why oeg is is looking at um sustainability data Thanks, Becca. Yeah, absolutely. I think sustainability has been a, a topic of conversation, obviously, for, for some time. And I think about sort of 18 months ago, pre-pandemic, we were hearing a lot about flight shaming. And that, that was kind of the, the, the topic of conversation, that the phrase phrases that were being used. And then a lot of um, speak about sustainability has probably a lot of people would feel gone quiet particularly in aviation dealing with the pandemic obviously taking precedence um but in the background i, I kind of believe that a lot of companies have been working hard to think about how they were going to come out of the pandemic stronger from a sustainability point of view and, and lots of initiatives have been happening in the background um, and that's led to actually in the last few weeks um, a huge increase in sustainability coverage within the industry and and obviously the ir to agm and the uh, resolution committing to net zero by 2050 is a big part of that um, we've also seen uh, some of the big uh, shall we say travel players um, bringing emissions information um, much more available to to passengers there's been a lot of coverage around sustainable aviation fuels um, John's talked about sort of right-sizing aircraft from a longer-term fleet plan, but we're also hearing that airlines are kind of right-sizing as an operational process and procedure to make sure that they are, you know, keeping their load factors as high as possible uh, and ma managing their kind of uh, fuel consumption as a result. And then, uh, somewhat outside the industry, but heavily affected by aviation the kind of the financial side of things and the requirements for ESG reporting. Um, for many companies, uh, air travel is a big part of their sustainability or their kind of emissions creation, so carbon footprint. So it's a, it's a, it's a topic that is therefore kind of affecting everyone and everyone is thinking about uh, aviation. So it's, it's a really challenging goal, though, isn't it? So the, the idea of, of net zero by 2050 is there's there's no two ways about it. It's challenging. And we borrowed these charts from IATA. But, you know, in this one on the right, to get there, they're looking at, at a sustainable aviation fuel contributing perhaps 65 percent of what's needed to get to that net zero. That seems quite a challenge, doesn't it, given that there's there's not so much sustainable aviation fuel available today. That's right. I think we've got sort of seven feedstocks up and running um, currently um, feeding into the network, but um, definitely more needed. And if we are to achieve these targets and the, the contribution that SAF will have, um, many, many more feedstocks need to come on board uh, to do that. I think you know, SAF is a, is a solution that a lot of people within the industry do like because to some extent the airlines have a little bit more control over it. Um, you know, new aircraft technology is is a much longer term solution. Um, offsetting and, and so on and so forth is is becoming less popular, uh, somewhat seen as you know hiding the problem. The emissions are still being created, uh, just offset. Um, people uh, would much prefer to to not create those emissions in the first place. So, um, yeah, very very stretched target. Um, but I think uh, as we've seen from the AGM. Um, one that people are prepared to sign up to. So hopefully uh, they believe that it's achievable and it will be a tough one. Okay, so um, 
OEG has been looking at how to calculate the emissions um, associated with specific flights. And I think this has been a, some time in the, in the making, hasn't it, Matt, and something you've, you've been really keen to do. When we think about where emissions come from, we've listed a number of, of elements here. Obviously, the type of aircraft, you know, if it's older or newer or, or you know, turboprop or a jet makes a difference, the size of the aircraft, the number of flights, the congestion that, that it, it undergoes and, and the fossil fuel type. So it's a complicated task coming up with a, a sense of what the emissions are for a particular flight. I, I'm sort of interested because here we've given an example of um, Google are using some of the OEG data to, to actually assign a value uh, when consumers go to look for information now, which is it has to be a good step forward, doesn't it? Definitely, and a, and a big part of the whole sustainability conversation is about communication and awareness and increasing, not just within the industry, but passenger awareness of, of the impact. And, and aviation doesn't have a great name when it comes to emissions, uh, it tends to be um, beaten up by other sectors as, as the bad guys. So I think there's a lot of people within the industry definitely want to um, improve that reputation. And so, yeah, we've, we've been looking at calculating carbon emissions. Um, we work on a per flight basis uh, using our schedules and status data, as well as some fleet data. Um, and as you've listed here for us, looking at the aircraft type, also the engine type, and making sure that we can you know, look at the actual flight performance. So how long was the aircraft in taxi at either end of flight? How long was the actual flight rather than just the scheduled block times? Um, so lots of lots of detailed information going in uh, and as I say, trying to use actual information. Um, and we, we do that on uh, looking back at history at flights that are completed, and then you use that information to project forward what we think the emissions will be on future scheduled flights. And so here, the example with Google, you can see flights that are uh, being displayed so that a person can buy tickets, a passenger can buy their ticket, um, and you're getting a, a measure of the CO2 emissions and then also kind of a, a, a relativity versus the other flights that are available in terms of, so that the one circled is the average emissions for this particular route and then um, whether or not um, the Frontier flight is coming up at 11% lower than the average and the Spirit one at 7% over. So we, we, we have yet to see whether consumers would make decisions based on this information. Um, they're quite likely to make a decision based on the number to the right um, at the fare. But we, we've had a question um, about what budget is being allocated to reduce emissions by airlines. And I know that's not really your area, perhaps, but, but the budgets, but Matt, Mark, um, John, there are lots of initiatives happening, aren't there, with, within the industry to reduce emissions. It isn't just a matter of sort of some um, greenwashing or, or communications level. It's that there's, there's actually real things happening, aren't there, with aircraft technology and with airlines changing their fleets to, to more fuel efficient aircraft. Uh, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's a huge area, Becca, and it's not just, you know, the airlines, it's people like Eurocontrol who are trying to to assist in the way that aircraft are routed through airspace um, and avoiding, um, you know, holding over, stacking over Heathrow for 30 minutes before you land and all of these sort of things. Uh, through to to uh, ground handling agents, everyone is is you know looking at ways how they can help and challenge this. I, to Matt's point, it, it seems to me the airline industry has has been really, really poor at promoting the amount of effort it is taking and the amount of activity um, that has gone into uh, reducing its carbon footprint. And, you know, that doesn't mean there's any room for complacency. There's a lot more work to be done. Um, but it, it just seems to me that we sometimes get, the industry sometimes gets bad press because, because it's an easy target. Um, and in fact, if you look at how much progress has been made, um, a lot of work has gone into it. It's, I, I, I can see where the, it's difficult though, isn't it? We've been talking about capacity increasing and, and there's you know, fundamental issues there, aren't there, with you know, growth in the industry and, uh, and trying to keep the emissions down. Um, let's have a look at um, some, Matt, OEG's put out some um, information about 
um, this emissions data that they're, they're making available and, and saying that there's, I think you've put together four use cases, but there, there's more than this. So what, who needs this sort of emissions data in the industry? Do you want to just walk us through some of these? I know you mentioned the ESG reporting. Yeah, and, and the, the Google example is a, is a good one for the, the passenger decision making. So giving passengers that information at the point they're looking to buy a ticket rather than kind of retrospectively um, allowing them to kind of offset their, their flight down the track. Again, try and reduce the emissions in the first place rather than offset them uh, later. ESG reporting, as I mentioned, um, we have you know, ESG reporting has become huge in, in financial circles with regulations kicking in now that increase the, the volume of information that organisations need to provide. But also just simply with the number of people who are ticking the sustainable box on their pension contributions, meaning that far more funds are tied up in sustainable funds and therefore uh, anyone looking to kind of invest and use that that money has to prove their investments are flowing to sustainable um, places so it, it's really putting pressure on on kind of that that ESG reporting and making sure that organizations are kind of presenting accurate information in order to access the sustainable funds um, I did mention carbon offsetting um, you may be able to tell I'm not a huge fan of, of, of that being the preferred solution um, but it's still an important solution, particularly for leisure passengers and giving them the opportunity to offset and offset accurately and understand the emissions of their flight. So um, keen to put, to kind of provide data out to, to those organisations. And, and cor um, yeah, corporate travel departments are also doing the same thing, aren't they? Having to do, do they are. And, 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 and corporates are a, a really key player, I think, because... Um, in both offsetting, but also in sustainable aviation fuel. I think many airlines will find targeting corporates to um, to fund sustainable aviation fuel will be um, far more achievable than, than targeting individual leisure passengers. Um, so trying to get that um, supplement to, to, to pay for that. Um, but it, also in carbon offsetting, because many companies are making those um, same commitments to um, achieve net zero by uh, 2050 or before and so they're looking at carbon offsetting as one of the you know, contributing factors to that to that process so um, yeah, as, as you say corporates will be will be far will be very important to that whole process perhaps just to complete on this slide I think the last point there um, is where we look kind of more into the industry itself so looking at fuel consumption and operational efficiency and I think to your point the question you asked a moment ago um, and the investment from airlines into sustainability. If if they get it right, um, a lot of the time, being more sustainable saves cost. So whether it's saving on fuel, whether it's reducing waste on board, um, saving weight in the aircraft from not putting X, Y, or Z um, perishables onto the aircraft, you're not you know, you're saving the weight and you're saving the waste so um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for the airlines to, to save cost as well as um, reduce emissions uh, so so investing in in, in that way and uh, is, is definitely a win-win hopefully for the airlines and they'll see it that way and um, we are seeing that investment coming through great let's have a look at some of this later oh John was that you yeah yeah, Becca, I was going to say, it's a tough call for an airline CEO, though, isn't it? You know, do you invest in sustainability, which is going to cost you money, potentially, or do you worry about your shareholders or some of your shareholders who will want you to actually begin to give them a return on their goodwill and the additional investment they've made in recent times? Um, and, you know, walking that line is really, really difficult. Um, and... CEOs must must wonder how they can do that given where the industry is at this moment in time. Two years ago, it would have been a very different position, and you know they would have been better placed. But at the moment, it's it's a hard call. It, it it is a hard call if you have to make that investment, sort of, and that that initial upfront cost, I guess. But as I say, if if the result is a re, a reduction in the fuel that you're consuming, and and you get a saving as a result of that. And you can balance that particular equation, then, then hopefully that's where the the win-win, as I say, is. 
So let's look at the, some of the data that you've been able to uh, to produce to show us today. So we've got uh, we've chosen 25 airlines here. There's five, uh, I think the five largest from uh, each of a number of each of five regions. So it's a slightly eclectic mix of, of airlines there. And the height of each bar is the CO2 emissions that OEG is calculated. Um, by airline for the month of November, according to the schedule. And then the color of the bar is the CO2 per ASK. So um, adjusted, CO2 emissions adjusted for how far they've flown. So it, no surprise, Southwest is the, the largest of these. Um, and then we've got a couple of airlines that shop as Red, JAL and uh, Azul further down the list. So we're seeing quite a lot of information here, aren't we, about um, emissions up by, by airline yeah absolutely and, and the data is is we've been playing with it for a while now um as you know i like to play with data um yeah, but yeah. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's um it's still taking time to kind of get used to what we've what we can see and, and what we can understand and, and how we present that so um a few additional pieces of information about what you can see here southwestern american operating very similar numbers of flights in and around sort of 207,000 flights or 210,000 flights respectively um, but the southwest emissions uh, for the total month of November are up at um, over five and a half million tons so you know, indicating there that the kind of the, the emissions for uh, southwest obviously higher and then you get the, that color kicking in which is showing that um, on that uh, available seat kilometer basis to, to back so that up. Capacity, isn't it? So if you but if you if you took load factors into account and it was passengers on a per passenger basis, assuming that Southwest has slightly fuller planes than or a lot fuller planes than American, you know, maybe maybe they would be not as different. There's lots of ways to look at the data, isn't there? There is absolutely and and then you can can move into the world of you know cargo load factors as well and, and you can get a lot more granular and um you know, particularly when we were talking about the kind of the, the either the offsetting or taking uh, a passenger taking responsibility for their emissions you know, how we allocate that out by cabin class as well and thinking about should the emissions for a, for a business class passenger be higher than that for an economy passenger uh and on which on what basis is it floor space within the cabin or is it um because you know, Typically, you'd expect those two passengers to board with similar weights and baggage weights, etc. So, it, it's it's a it's a fascinating world, and I think there's a lot of there's a need for clearer data, for more data to be available. Um, not necessarily just an, an output of an emissions number, but sufficient data for people to make their own judgments and and so on and so forth on on emissions. And 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 what. As with all data, you, you do have to dig in, don't you, and understand it. So I know when we looked at this earlier and we looked at Japan Airlines, thought, oh gosh, that's that's red, that can't be good. But of course, they've got aircraft that would typically be used on long haul services that are currently being used domestically. So they're going to be performing uh, well below what they, they normally would. So you do need to understand the market, understand what you're looking at, but it's a, a good start to have some, some solid data on which to make some analysis of, of these things. Yeah, absolutely, and, and both those sort of uh, JAL and Azul, um, there's a, there's a significant impact on their emissions and their CO2 by ASK based on the aircraft types that they're operating, um, and and those red bars are are heavily influenced by their use of turboprops. Right. So we've taken this data and um, dug down a little bit further. We've looked at um, six of these or seven of these airlines. Um, we've compared two airlines in each case that are that operate a, a common route. So the top right, we've got both Lufthansa and British Airways operate Frankfurt, Luf, uh, Frankfurt Heathrow. Um, below that, we've got All Nippon and Japan Airlines who operate uh, Sapporo to Haneda, and then Southwest Delta and Spirit operate Atlantic. Baltimore. So we can see there quite clearly where there's a, um, an airline that's um, operating with more or, or less emissions per ASK. Yeah, so the, the two charts on the right um, where you have uh, Lufthansa and All Nippon, uh, they're operating substantially more flights on this particular route than, than um, British Airways and JAL respectively. Um, 
so the, the total volume of emissions is is higher, um, but the colour indicates that um, the uh, the CO2 per ASK for, for both those two is is lower, so um, somewhat more fuel efficient when they are operating, although they're operating at a higher volume total. Um, whereas on the left, um, you can see that sort of Southwest are operating higher volume of flights and total emissions is higher, um, but that's also because they are um, their individual flights or um, are emitting more emission, emitting more emissions, should I say, um, <laughs> per ASK. So, great. So sort of different examples. Let me let me bring you back in, John and Mark. Have you have you any more thoughts about how this data is needed in the industry and where it's going to be used? Um, I think I think it's really useful. Uh, you know, we need these types of insights, um, not just. The headline numbers that we got here but also the detail behind it I think it it helps us in our understanding of, of what we can do um, I always wonder whether the consumer will will pay for a a, a more carbon friendly uh, flight um, I think price ultimately will will be a factor in all of these things but uh, yeah I think it's uh, it's good to have the data available and you know as you say we love playing with data and there's another data set we can play with <laughs> Thanks. Also, kind of ties back to the A380 a little bit we talked about earlier. Um, I think that the cut of the schedules for this slide was slightly before one or two of the airline announcements. So, I think BA are going to put the A380 on Frankfurt, John. I think so. Um, that red yeah, that will, that will be horrible, Mark. That will be absolutely <laughs> horrible. Um, but it's Singapore, free... Singapore Airlines, I think, are putting it on um, Singapore to Kuala Lumpur for sort of reproving yeah. flights as well so yeah but uh, Becca I mean it, it's interesting while we've been on the webinar and and to a question that Olaf uh, asked earlier on about legislation um, you know we are at the mercy of governments in, in all of this recovery and we will be in the whole emissions game as well um, but the Moroccan government has just announced um, the banning of all flights from the United Kingdom the Netherlands and Germany because of increased in, uh, COVID infection rates from 23.59 tonight. How on earth can travellers have confidence uh, of going to a destination or coming, or coming back from a destination when a country imposes a deadline in seven hours time? It's just, that is the sort of behaviour that is, you know, present just frustrating the whole industry from its recovery. Yeah, I I thought we'd uh, we perhaps got to the end of those very short notice uh, things. Thanks for pointing that out, John. Um, I, I know it's a huge frustration to you that the industry so can, can operate or governments can operate in that way. I just want to come back very briefly to the emissions. Mark, Matt, where can people get hold of this data? We've had a couple of questions about whether this will be made public. Um, are they available to consumers? I think we've already seen that there's some consumer data out there, if you, certainly through Google, if you're looking at flights. Um, where can people turn to for, for this data? Certainly. So, yeah, we're, we're keen to make this information available and make it public. We are you know, working um, on a basis of a proof of concept at the moment. So we have a data set for all flights in 2019. Uh, and similarly, we have uh, a data set which looks at a uh, year's forward-looking schedule and we've applied the emissions to that data as well um, and we'd be, be happy to, to share that with people um, and get their feedback and tell us what they think. We're continuing to evolve the model um, incorporate more aspects that we think may make the model as accurate as we as we want it to be. I say that because we don't want to go too far and get over uh, granular so um, yeah please please get in touch with your respective account manager or um, you're welcome to contact myself um, and uh, we'll, we're happy to share. That's great. Thanks very much. We're, we're out of time now. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining today. Thank you for the questions. We've tried to answer as many as we can as we've gone through. Um, we will be back next month. We don't have a date yet, so uh, do, do look out for the emails from OEG telling you when the next webinar will be. Thank you very much, John and Mark and Matt, for all the insights you've, uh, you've given us today. Um, and good to see some new data coming out of OEG as well. So uh, any final words, Matt, Mark, John? I know John's already said his. He's given his piece. <laughs>
I'll just mention that Deirdre's put in the, the web link for the emissions data, oeg.com forward slash emissions hyphen data. It's in the chat for everyone. So, oh, yeah, okay, we'll that's just, great. That's really helpful. So, yeah, go to the chat area to see that link for the emissions data from OEG. That'd be great. Okay, thanks very much. And we'll uh, hopefully see you all again or talk to you all again uh, next month. Bye then. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. bye.